now that we have that going. Um, today's speaker is Amy Leffringhaus, and Amy is a Natural Resources Environment and Energy Extension Educator. So we're excited for our winter night sky tour, Amy, so I'll go ahead and turn it over to you. <laughs> Thank you so much, Erin, and um, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome. Um, like Erin said, if you want to get your phone out or your device out, and scan the QR code or go to that uh, web address above the Illinois map. We Everyone can see where you are from. Uh, we're gonna use this uh, poll again uh, for a few other activities throughout the webinar. So this will get you um, into that system. Um, as for me, I am coming to you from Good old Pike County, Illinois. I'm over here on the west central side of the state. I'm in the land uh, between the rivers over here in Pike County. So I'm really ha happy to be here and to be talking to you this afternoon about the night sky. So uh, let's get started. Um, today we will be uh, with that. Through the, throughout the next hour, we will be, I will be sharing with you how to become a better stargazer and amateur astronomer. I will, I will be sharing tips and um, just little tools that I use in my experience. Um, when you think about the night sky, um, you probably, and when you think of the words everyday environment, or you think of the words natural resources, um, you probably don't think about the night sky, but it is a resource that we um, need to pay attention to. So we're going to go over the benefits of a dark sky. Uh, we're going to go over uh, the process and how to prepare yourself for a stargazing session, um, give, you, give you a basic orientation to the night sky, what objects that we might look for um, when we're looking up into the sky. We're going to go through a tour of different winter night sky objects that we can see here from Illinois. Um, and then as we go through the webinar today, um, I'll be throwing out different tools and resources that I use, and Erin will be um, sharing those uh, links in the chat box as we go along. And like Aaron said, um, we'll have some time for um, question and answer um, at the end of the webinar today. So I want to kick things off. Um, this is uh, a, an activity I like to I like to do um, with other groups, but um, I want you to again use your phone or a device. We can see if we get any responses here, but I want you to think about one commercial product um, that is related to astronomy, space, or the night sky. Um, words should pop up if you type them into your phone and click submit, they should pop up on here um, today. Um, an example could be like a Ford Taurus car um, that, I don't know if they still make Ford Taurus cars, but that's an example. Um, what are other uh, commercial products that you can think of that are astronomy related? I'll give you a, a few seconds here. What about a brand, brand names? like the Ford Taurus. Ooh, I see Comet, Comet like the cleaner, a Saturn car, I see that. Oh, Sirius Radio, Sirius XM. Orion, there's a telescope, a brand of Orion telescopes. Moon Pies, that's a good one. Mars Bars. That's fun. The Apollo Theater. Yes, yes, wonderful. Well, great job. Um, this just show this activity just shows that um, as a society, we really have a really big fascination with astronomy um, and the stars. They've inspired us and and they have um, kind of infused itself into our commercial products. So marketing people like to use that and, and it brings uh, to mind a lot of different um, uh, fascinating uh, things to people's mind when they think about astronomy and related things. Some other um, examples are like a Chevy Nova, 
Um, those have been obviously Comet, the cleaner. Um, this a Subaru is actually, if you look on the um, the logo of a Subaru car, uh, Subaru actually means um, the Pleiades in Japanese. So those stars on the front of a Subaru, Subaru car are actually the Pleiades, which is which is kind of neat. So just a fun activity to start off. Um, and celestial events. So celestial events get really uh, a lot of attention in the media, the social media. And I didn't know if anyone, hopefully you guys had a better night sky than I had last night. It was fairly overcast and, and cloudy for the lunar occultation of Mars. Um, so the uh, lunar occultation just means that the moon um, moved between um, us standing on the earth, our perspective on the earth and Mars. The, moved, the moon moved between uh, Mars and actually covered up Mars for about an hour last night. Um, but there were also other really cool things that all happened at once last night. The moon was full, which was neat. Mars was also in opposition, um, which means the sun, uh, the earth, and Mars were all together in a straight line. And Mars was also closest to the Earth last night. And so the brightest in our in our sky um, last night. So a lot of things were happening last night. Um, the lunar occultation of Mars only happens every 26 months. So the next time this occurs uh, won't be until January of 2025. So uh, this picture is from Stellarium, uh, which is a planetarium software, uh, open source free software online. And lots, I'm sure lots of astrophotographers last night were trying to get this exact image where Mars is right on the edge of the moon. So hopefully um, where you were located, you were able to see um, to see some of this last night. So why do we want to stargaze in the winter time? Um, the winter time gives us a lot of advantages um, of stargazing. Obvious, the obvious uh, kind of con about winter stargazing is that the um, the temperature is cold, right? But we can we can um, put on our layers and things like that to abate the cold. But the air, the atmosphere is a lot clearer in the winter time. There is less humidity other than last night and the last few nights. Um, typically the atmosphere is a lot more clear, less humid in, in the winter time. The winter um, hours of darkness are a lot longer. So it gets early or it gets dark really early. So 440, I think is my sunset over here um, in Western Illinois. So we can get out into the field uh, fairly early rather than in the summertime when we're going out at around 10 o'clock and we're trying to stay up uh, super late to see those objects. But uh, when uh, we can get out into that field early, that's one of the um, advantages of stargazing in the winter time. Um, we also have beautiful, beautiful constellations, stars, um, all different types of things that come out during the winter season. Uh, so that's a, another advantage of stargazing in the winter time. And there's no, there are no insects in the winter time, so you don't have to battle the insects. So we're going to go through a little bit of a checklist here, um, finding our date and location um, if we want to have a stargazing session, gathering our supplies, orienting ourselves uh, with the sky and finding objects. So in terms of finding a location, I want to turn your um, attention to this light pollution map. Um, this is the website up above. Um, if you are going out in your backyard, say, um, this might not be too helpful, although you can look at your location on this map at any time and see what your uh, brightness of your sky is. But if you're making a trip outside of town or outside of city limits and trying to find somewhere where you want to, you know, ensure that you're going to have a, um, a dark sky, this is a great, great map to use. It's, it's you know, spans all over the world. Um, I want to turn your attention to this Bortle class code here. Um, this is a location where I like to, um, to stargaze. And it's obviously in this blue area, which is darker, which is awesome. But it is a class three sky on the Bortle scale. Um, so I want you to remember that. And on this next slide, I'll show you a little bit more about the Bortle scale. So these numbers up here. Um, show the Bortle scale. Um, 
going from one as a very, very dark sky up to nine, which is an inner city, inner city sky where you can only see um, some of the brightest objects. Um, our, when we're finding a location, we want that kind of goal to find that three to four, class three or class four sky. That's where we can get the, the, the best views of, of objects that, that we want to see. Um, but why, what are the benefits of this dark sky? Why do we want it to be dark? And what, um, what can happen if it isn't dark? Um, the benefits really are uh, for us, for our wildlife, for our plants, um, for both, for all of us. Um, a dark sky really signals to, to wildlife um, different events in their life cycle. So whether it be bird migration, um, whether it be a breeding season, uh, for plants, um, it's going to, that length of darkness is going to um, signal different events in their life cycle. Pollen, there are some pollinators that only um, pollinate during um, the dark sky hours. So that dark sky is really um, important to uh, the survival of those uh, plants and animals. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, nocturnal wildlife, they are surviving in the nighttime, right? That is when they're feeding and they're hunting. So they need that, that dark sky. Um, as far as humans are concerned, um, a dark sky really improves our sleep quality. There are there has been research done um, that if uh, we have too much light, too much brightness, it will interrupt our circadian rhythm, our day and night uh, rhythm, which leads to lots of different um, illnesses, um, health, health issues and things like that. So a, a dark sky really improves our sleep quality. It reduces glare as well. Um, you guys know when you're driving at night or when you're walking at night, um, a dark sky reduces that glare. And of course, um, for all of us on this call um, that are interested in the night sky, we get a better view of the, of the stars. So I just really wanted to point out these benefits because going back into your communities, and looking at the light fixtures and looking at how your con community is um, putting out light and light pollution might be something that you want to do as you're moving forward and, and, and going through your journey of, of becoming a better um, stargazer, amateur astronomer, and that sort of thing. <clears throat> So back to our location, we've used the light map, light pollution map. We want that class three or four um, sky. Moving outside of city limits, 20 to 30 miles is a great thing to do if you're find, trying to find a location um, to go. A high altitude is great if you've got uh, bluffs or um, higher overlook points. Uh, paying attention to the horizon obstacles, um, you might want to see some of those um, objects that are in the horizon. So just paying attention if you have buildings and trees or things like that. Just kind of planning ahead um, about where you want to go. Knowing your latitude as well, um, some celestial events like last night, the occultation um, wasn't seen um, all over North America. So I'm in Pike County, which is over here between the 39 and 40 degree latitude um, lines. But knowing your location and your um, latitude and longitude is important when you're, um, you know, Googling different events that are happening. Am I going to see this eclipse? Am I going to see this conjunction or different types of events? Um, knowing where you're at um, is important. Um, before you make a trip out there to go see something that you might not be able to see. And then, of course, it almost goes without saying, but make sure you have landowner owner permission if you're going out on to private property or finding a public space um, is, is a part of that checklist of finding your location. Obviously, dates, when we're looking at different dates, um, we want to find a, a clear night. And one of the tools that I use to make sure that the, the, um, the night's the Sky is going to be clear is, is a website called cleardarksky.com. Um, this is a screenshot, but it shows out three days um, ahead what the cloud cover can be is going to be. Um, typically, I'm using this top line here and, and looking to see what my cloud cover can be. There's lots of other different factors that you can um, use here, especially if you're more advanced and you're using um, different tools and you really, really um, want to see something, there are, are lots of different um, factors here that you can look at to make sure that your date is going to work out uh, before you go set up all your things or travel or that sort of thing. Also, the moon phase, um, you want the sky to be as dark as possible um, when you are, are looking at objects. And a new moon is obviously most ideal if you're looking at stars and other objects outside of the moon. 
Um, if you're studying the moon, obviously um, you want to look at different phases of the moon at different times, but NASA has a great tool where you can just put in the, the month and the day and figure out what your moon phase is um, before you make that trip. And what's going to be in the sky on the date that you want to go out? Um, I have a few different tools that I like to use to, to print out my sky uh, star charts. Um, sky and Telescope has a great interactive um, star chart tool online. It'll print out a black and white copy of this, but you can put your location, your date, your time. Um, it gives you a printout of um, the stars and the objects in the sky at that particular time. Um, at the Astronomical League um, also has a really great monthly guide that, um, I don't know, picks out different cool features, um, really focuses on star hopping through um, the sky and what, what you can look through um, throughout a whole month. So I like to use that often as well. Oh, I forgot to mention NASA Night Sky Network also has a night sky planner um, on their website as well. It's usually just a one night um, thing. So, you know, you're getting on there one night, what's going on that night. It has the moon phase and different types of things. So that's a great resource, NASA Night Sky Network. Supplies. So making a grab and go kit. Um, some of you guys might be a little bit more advanced on your journey. Some of you guys might be beginners, but um, this is something, these are the things that I like to take out when I go out. Number one, a red flashlight or headlamp, make sure, making sure that it has that red um, feature on there. When you're flipping back and forth between your sky chart, you're looking at your sky chart, you're turning it on, you're looking back up at the sky, you want to make sure that's, that light is red so that it doesn't affect your eyes. Turning on and off a white light um, really affects your eyes. There are also, if you have um, apps that you're using on your phone, most of those um, apps have um, a night vision or a night light um, option when you're out in the field as well. Um, a laser pointer. Um, you guys may or may not have used this before, but a green, um, preferably green laser pointer. You can go online and find these as a, astronomy laser pointers. It is the best tool to use if you are with a partner or with a group um, to point out things in the sky. You know, you're trying to look up and you're like, oh, over there, over there, over there, but the laser pointer really helps. Um, and it's a really great tool. Uh, to have in your in your bag. Binoculars, a lot of people ask, oh, what, what should be my first telescope? Binoculars. Binoculars should be your first telescope. <laughs> um, they're not a lot of investment. Typically, people have them in their house houses. Um, I think, Erin, you have a, a link on there. The NASA Night Sky Network has um, a really great uh, write-up about what types of binoculars would be um, best to use for astronomy, but they don't have to be um, super fancy. And binoculars, you know, at first I was a skeptic, but then I started to use my binoculars more and more. And there's a lot of things that you can see. In fact, um, the Royal Astronomical League of Canada has a um, entire program uh, that has, uh, I think, over 155 different targets that you can find um, with binoculars. So they're they're really a good thing to have in your kit. Um, obviously, a star chart like we just talked about um, and a clip. I like to put mine on a clipboard so I'm not losing it um, is goes in your your kit and then a smartphone with different apps. Um, I like to try to go app list, um, you know, and trying to locate things myself and just challenge myself to find these things. Um, but it is nice if you needed it, if you were just walking out of your backyard and you were, you know, looking up in the sky and you just wanted to see something real quick. Um, but that smartphone, it also has a compass on there so you can orient yourself to north uh, fairly easily as well. Comfort items, you guys know, um, but your blanket, your reclining chair, those zero gravity chairs are pretty awesome. Um, hot drinks if you're in the wintertime, handed foot warmers, and then if it's summertime, uh, don't forget that insect repellent. So once we're out in the field, so we've got ourselves together, we've got everything in our kit, we've got it by the door, right? So we are um, we are getting ready to go out to the field. Once we get out there, we need to orient ourselves to north. And when I used to teach this at another at uh, to kiddos, we would be like, well, well, which way is north? And they would say, oh, the North Star. Well, well, where is that? And then they they didn't know. But um, easy ways to find north, obviously a compass. 
Second, if you know where the sun has, is, has set or you're out there and you know the direction the sun is set, north is going to be on your right, right? Um, so that's an easy way to find north, just to orient yourself to north. Star hopping and finding that, finding Polaris is, um, for me, one of the easiest, easiest ways to find Polaris or the North Star. So on this screen here, you can see um, the Big Dipper, part of Ursa Major. Um, you see the handle coming up from the bottom and you see the pan here. If you follow the two stars at the end of the pan of the Big Dipper, you will always point yourself toward the North Star right here. So that's called star hopping when you use constellations um, to guide yourself to another star or another constellation. Um, that's what we call star hopping. So that is um, how to find the North Star fairly easily. Um, sky movement. So all of our, the sky is not moving, right? The earth is moving, but the sky from our vantage point is, or from our vantage point is moving from the east to the west. Um, so all around Polaris. And I'll show you in the next slide how that goes. Um, and then object location, uh, trying to figure out once we've found north, we know that the sky moves from east to west. How are we going to start to find objects? So star hopping is a nice process to use. Um, I think as you continue on your journey to become a better stargazer, uh, researching um, how to use celestial coordinates, um, right ascension and declination would be something that would be the next on your to-do to list if you don't know that already. Um, that is basically, um, you know, the la latitude and longitudinal grid up in the sky. Um, all of the stars and all of those objects have um, a coordinate that you, where, you, where you can find them. And constellations can be used to find um, objects. Um, you know, we might talk about um, where is Mars tonight? Where is Mars tonight? Because they wander around and Mars isn't, you know, Mars might be in um, the constellation Taurus. Find Taurus and you're fi you'll find the object. Um, so using constellations um, to find different objects in the sky is a good way to start, way to start as well. Um, this is a video here um, taken from Stellarium again. If you haven't used Stellarium, it's an awesome tool. Um, but I'm going to play this. And this is just showing tonight's night sky. Um, if you look at Taurus here, you can see Taurus is rising in the east. And coming across the sky, we've got the North Star here. This is our um, pole that everything is rotating around, right? So we're watching Taurus come across the sky and then set in the Western sky. So um, that is the sky movement. And once you have that good understanding of that, um, you, will, you will be able to, to continue to locate objects a lot easier. So when we go outside, and this is this is something that I learned as I started to go outside, I was like, oh yeah, that's cool. There's this constellation and that's constellation, but what else? What are we, what else are we looking for out here? Um, I, you know, what 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 exciting things are we looking for? Um, but we're we're looking for different different types of objects. Planets and moons obviously are your brightest um, objects in the sky, Jupiter, Mars, Saturn, our own moon. Um, stars, there are all kinds of different um, variations of stars that we'll go through. Uh, we might look for meteors or meteor showers um, during different times of year. And then, of course, celestial events like we had last night, the occultation, the lunar occultation of Mars, um, eclipses, um, conjunctions where two objects appear to be meeting each other in the sky. Um, those are all different types of things that you can put in kind of your star life list. You know, some people have like a bird life list, right? This is like a star or night sky object life list that we want to we want to find on our own, which I it's a which is exciting for me. So let's start with our planets and moons. These are um, the brightest objects in the sky. These are the first ones that are going to come out. Um, uh, of an evening, the first things you're going to see right now, we're seeing Jupiter, Saturn, and Mars um, in our night sky. They're also called the wanderers. So stars and constellations are always 
located in the same spot, right? We might see different um, uh, constellations during different times of year, but they're always oriented next to the same other constellations. They're always in the same spot. Planets, on the other hand, are wanderers. So they're all over everywhere. They're, they're orbiting the sun just like we are orbiting the sun. So you never know. Um, well, I mean, we do know, but you, they're not going to be in the same same place each night. Um, they follow an ecliptic, which is the path of the sun, the plat, the planets, um, the moon, all follow this imaginary line around our sky or through the sky um, that is called the ecliptic. Um, and in fact, all the zodiac signs um, are uh, located on the ecliptic, and that's that's how that came about. And then our moon, of course, we can study our moon. We can do a lot of, uh, try to locate a lot of things on our moon, the lunar seas, impact craters, looking at it at different phases are all things that we can study um, when, when we're looking at these objects. This is a um, just kind of a picture that's showing um, the ecliptic in the sky, just that imaginary line that, that goes through the sky. Um, when you're looking at different star charts and things like that, a lot of times they'll show the ecliptic um, on your star chart, but um, the sun, the moon, and all of our planets follow that same imaginary line through the sky. Moving on to stars. So there's lots of different variations and things that we can we can look for when we're looking um, at stars. Um, double stars, uh, Miser and Alcor, which are in um, Ursa Major or the Big Dipper. Um, constellations we'll go through here in a little bit when we go through our winter night sky tour. Um, different star clusters. Um, so we have open or globular um, star clusters, which we're showing Pleiades here. We'll talk more about Pleiades here in a bit. And then nebulae. So um, this is the Orion Nebula. Um, star nurseries. Um, I was reading and doing some research and star nurseries look like a baby, you know, all wrapped up in a blanket. They have lots of dust and, and um, particles and things all around them. And it's really makes it really interesting um, to look at the night sky. Constellations. Um, I want to give you, before we dive into constellations, I want to give you a little bit of a um, historical context of um, constellations. I'm going to try to get this website over here for you guys to see. I'm not sure if you'll be able to see it. Can you see this, Erin? <laughs> we see your PowerPoint screen. You see the PowerPoint screen. Okay. Let me see if I can, how about this? Yes. So this website is, is pretty cool. It's a visual re representation website of, of how um, different constellations are, or how the stars are interpreted differently. So of course the night sky, you know, is, it has been um, here over time. It connects all of us from different locations. It connects all of us um, through time, right? But different cultures looked at the stars differently. So we all had different stories um, from the sky. Um, our Western um, constellations are what modern astronomers use today. We have 88 um, different constellations that are um, lined out in the sky. Um, and that are referred to by modern astronomers. But, but different cultures use um, different constellations and, and, and tell stories in different ways. So this is a, just a, a graphic showing Betelgeuse. And Betelgeuse is a star within Orion, um, the big supergiant, red supergiant star in Orion. And you can see in our constellation, Western constellation Orion, but all these different colored lines are the different ways that different sky cultures have um, referred to Betelgeuse. So Western, our Western culture, we of course um, use Betelgeuse in Orion, which is the great hunter. And we'll talk more about Orion. But if we look over here at Egyptian culture, they use Betelgeuse in a different way. So they um, put together different pictures in the sky. Um, this, uh, this is a humanoid you know, type of figure here. And this is the father of their gods called Saw. 
Um, and the Egyptian culture have only 28 constellations um, that they interpreted in the sky and had um, different meanings behind. If we turn to the Navajo culture, they only had eight different constellations in the sky. And they use Betelgeuse and this um, constellation called the first slim one, um, who was a leader who led um, tribes or led people across from a land of desolation to a land of peace and harmony. Um, so this is supposedly his uh, walking stick and or his or her walking stick. Um, but it's just very interesting how uh, the sky is kind of that natural wonder and the only natural wonder that hasn't changed over time. You know, our landscape has changed a lot over time, um, but the night sky hasn't. So I just thought this was really interesting just to see that historical context of different constellations. All right, we're going to try to switch back over here. All right, can you see my screen? Uh, we see the presenter mode, so we can see your notes. No, oh, that's weird. Let's see. How about this one? Better? Yes. Okay. Good to go. Okay. So now we're going to move on. We've got a little bit of historical contents about our constellations. What are we going to see tonight and throughout the winter time in the Illinois winter night sky? So um, as oddly as it is to start off with, um, we can see the summer triangle, but it is in the ending um, time frame of its um, existence in the night sky. So the summer uh, triangle is composed of three very bright stars um, in the night sky, easy, easy to identify um, and find. So when, when you're going out there in the night sky for the first time, those the brightest objects out there are the first things that are gonna stick out to you, right? The summer triangle, which would be in the Eastern sky, um, excuse me, the Western sky about ready to set is where you can find the summer triangle. So we've got, Vega down here in Lyra. We have Deneb, which is in Cygnus, the swan. And we have Altair over here, which is in Aquila, the eagle. It's the eagle eye. Um, so when you're out, this screen is showing you from Stellarium tonight, tonight's sky at eight o'clock at 8.01. So right before it sets in the Western horizon, you should be able to pick out um, the summer triangle before it, it fades away and gives way to the winter constellations. So here are a few that I'm going to um, kind of highlight that are some of the major constellations that um, can be found in the winter, winter night sky. And we'll start with Pegasus. Um, Pegasus is um, the, uh, the, a winged horse in Greek mythology, uh, but is also um, called the great square. So you have the term constellation and you have the term asterism. Asterism is different shapes in the sky, but not deemed a full constellation and not part of that, the 88 constellations that we have. Um, so Pegasus is the winged horse and that is um, its definition and as the constellation and has all these stars out here um, included in that. The asterism within Pegasus is called the Great Square, which is easy to find um, in the night sky. They're all about the same um, brightness. They can be found um, right above, excuse me, Jupiter. Um, and then um, some of the stories that come with Pegasus is um, obviously he is connected to Andromeda. Right over here off the screen is Perseus and Andromeda were married. Pegasus, as the winged horse, actually worked with Perseus to save Andromeda um, from the, the crazy sea dragon. So that's why they are located in the sky together. Um, 
so Pegasus is right here near the Andromeda galaxy as well, um, but Pegasus and, and the Andromeda constellation are, are connected. Pegasus actually was put up into the sky and Zeus, um, the god Zeus gave him um, the, uh, I guess, privilege to carry Zeus's thunder. So that's part of the, the Greek mythology behind Pegasus. But Pegasus, the great square, usually right above you. If you're looking, if you're facing south, it'll be right above you. Uh, four big stars. It's a giant constellation, really big, takes up a lot of space. Um, so that's Pegasus. Then we're going to go and we're going to kind of move, we're going to move across the sky um, as to what would be coming up first and setting first. So we're going to move next to Cassiopeia, which is um, a really easy constellation to see over and over again. Um, it is um, in the shape of a W. I always think, right, well, this is the shape of an M, but I, I always say a W and it looks like a crown in the night sky because Cassiopeia is the queen um, in, of the night sky. Um, it is a circumpolar um, constellation. It is closely located to Polaris or the North Star. So it is seen the entire year. It is It makes a tiny little circle around Polaris. So you can see Cassiopeia um, throughout the entire year. She was the mother, mother to Andromeda, which I just talked about, who was, um, uh, Cassiopeia was a very uh, arrogant individual. Her king, Cepheus, is right next to her, but they had their daughter Andromeda, and she thought they were most beautiful, the most beautiful things in the sky. And um, Poseidon, the king of the sea, didn't like that. So um, Cepheus and Cassiopeia had to, um, according to Greek mythology, had to sacrifice their daughter Andromeda, and then who then was saved by Perseus and Pegasus. So those are some of the stories that kind of go behind Cassiopeia. But Cassiopeia has very bright stars, uh, very easy to find. So then moving eastward here into the eastern sky, this is where we get have a lot of activity, a lot of really beautiful things going on. And this is what makes the winter sky just, just an amazing uh, winter time, an amazing time to look up at the sky. So the eastern sky, we have, first I'll talk about Orion, Taurus, and this little bitty star cluster up here called Pleiades. So Pleiades, I'll talk about Pleiades first, but Pleiades is the seven sisters. Um, but with the naked eye and with the binocular, binoculars, you can see more, but with the naked eye, you can almost only see six. So they wonder, um, scholars wonder in Greek mythology, did that seventh sister actually fall in love with Orion? So Pleiades is the seven sisters over here. Orion down here on the a lower part of my screen was in love with one of the seven sisters. So Orion being the great hunter is looking over here toward Pleiades and the seven, the seven sisters. Uh, one thing about Pleiades um, is a lot of people think that Pleiades or get Pleiades confused with the little dipper. Um, you can see kind of there's a, a shape, maybe resemblance possibly. Um, Pleiades is kind of like a little fuzzy, uh, fuzzy object in the sky. And a lot of people think that's, oh, that must be the Little Dipper. But as you can see, there's a, a big size difference between the Little Dipper and Pleiades. Um, and just, just note that, um, that, that, that there is a big difference between the two, um, as far as size. Um, these are the, some of the stars that you can see in Pleiades. Of course, there are more than seven sisters. Um, the rising of Pleiades over many, many cultures um, was very significant. So when Pleiades started to rise, um, it signaled um, different things in different cultures. It may have signaled in some cultures the beginning of a new year. It may have sig signaled the beginning of a growing season. Um, um, so Pleiades was mentioned over and over in lots of different ancient um, cultures. So we've talked about Pleiades. 
I want to move down here to Orion. Orion, like I said, is the great hunter, and he was in love with one of the, the Pleiades sisters. But Orion, from an astronomical standpoint, is amazing. It has a lot of interesting features inside of it. It has the big um, the star Betelgeuse, which is a red uh, supergiant. Uh, Betelgeuse is the 10th brightest object in the sky. It also has, I call it Rigel, some people pronounce it Rigel, but Rigel, um, it is a newer star. Um, you can see the difference in colors of these two stars, even when you're looking at it with the naked eye. Um, Betelgeuse being an older star is getting into the, the later stages of its life. Rigel being a newer star is that white, hot, um, kind of bluish white um, color. The mo some of the most notable, um, you know, easy to find objects in the sky within Orion is Orion's belt here, three stars in very close proximity, proximity to one another. They are all pretty much the same magnitude. Um, so they're all the same brightness. So you can see those fairly easily to locate Orion um, coming up in the eastern sky in the winter time. Um, Orion, these are his shoulders, these are his legs. We've got his sword that comes up here. We've got his shield here. Um, his right here coming off of his belt, belt and down, this is kind of what they call um, the sheath of Orion's sword. And down here is an amazing area called um, the Orion Nebula. And like I said, a nebula is a star nursery. And you can see this with um, binoculars really well. Um, all the new stars, the fuzziness, the particles around there um, is, is really, really a beautiful sight to see and really cool when you actually find it on your own without aids and um, you get that into your uh, binoculars or your telescope view. Um, between Pleiades and Orion, um, the king did not want um, Orion to fall in love with, with Pleiades. So he placed this Taurus, the bull, between the two figures to protect the Pleiades sisters from Orion. So right here in the middle, we have Taurus, the bull. And Taurus is the bull's eye. Aldebaran here is very, very bright star. Um, it is actually the 14th brightest star in the sky at night. Um, but you can see this nice little V and there's another um, cluster here called the Hyades um, cluster. So you've got the Pleiades and the Hyades right here next to one another. So another really beautiful um, object that you can see in the night sky with your binoculars. So we've got this story of these three characters here um, in the night sky. Um, moving on, um, let's talk about Capella because Capella actually is um, the sixth brightest star. So you're going to find Capella right um, right away because it is so bright near Pleiades. It's near Taurus. You'll be able to see it. See Capella. It's connected to this hexagonal um, hexagonal um, object called Auriga, which is a constellation of the charioteer, um, a chariot um, driver. Um, but Capella um, is, is a really beautiful star, a new a hot star that is really easy to see. Down below Auriga is Gemini, and Gemini are the twins. Um, the twins, uh, um, heads of the twins are noted by two really bright stars called Castor and Pollux. And Castor and Pollux can be easily found through star hopping. So if you start, if you find Orion in the winter night sky and start at Rigel, move through Betelgeuse and move up, you will find Castor and Pollux very easily. Sometimes people can be confused between Capella and its neighboring star in the Auriga constellation that might look like Castor and Pollux because they're near one another. Um, but you can tell that the magnitude, the brightness of Capella is so much different than its neighboring star. Um, you'll know that that, that is not um, Castor and Pollux of uh, the Gemini, Gemini constellation. 
So this is the eastern sky. This is um, about eight o'clock at night, like I said um, before. Lots of very, very interesting things, lots of things to see. Um, obviously, right now, the moon and Mars are over in this area as well at eight, at eight o'clock. So it's, it's just um, a really beautiful, um, beautiful area to discover um, in the night sky. Last, we talked about the four different types of objects. The last object or last um, types of objects that I want to talk about are meteor showers and comets. Um, annually, there is a meteor shower each, uh, a, a meteor shower that there are meteor showers that happen each year. Uh, right now, there's a meteor sh shower called the Geminids happening right now. Its peak comes in about a week um, or a little bit less than the week. Um, it is the most has the most meteors per hour than any other meteor um, shower that happens in our um, hemisphere. The only bad thing about this year um, with the Geminid meteor shower is the the moon is at seventy two percent, and like we talked about earlier, um, the moon is um, you know takes away some of that sky with its brightness, um, so you won't be able you'll still be able to see um, shooting stars or meteors. Um, streaking across the sky during that time, um, but you won't see as many. Um, the next meteor shower peaks around uh, the new year. It is another major meteor shower, but again, the moon is going to be almost full um, during that period of time, so you won't be able to see it at its peak. The Perseids, I'm sure um, those of you who are astronomy lovers um, know about the Perseid meteor shower. It's very popular, well-known, happens in the, at the end of summer. So a lot of people are able to um, take in this Perseid meteor shower. It's a medium level meteor shower at 50 to 70 meteors per um, hour. Uh, but the cool thing about this summer in 2023 is that the, the moon is gonna be just at 10%. Um, so we should be able to see see plenty of, of um, meteors during that meteor shower. So back to, I want to give you a little bit of a quiz before we are finish up by the end of the day. Um, back to your phones. If you get your phones out, um, scan the code. It might come up. Let me make sure over here I've got it activated. Um, but we you should, I want you to look at this this sky, you might have to zoom in on your phone if you have a smaller phone like I do, but I want you to test yourself in the sky. Somebody already has it, but test yourself in the sky. I tried to limit the number of visual cues that were out there, um, but this is what you're going to see. You're not going to see all the lines in the sky and you're not going to see all these labels in the sky. So can you find um, Orion's belt in this sky? We are looking, this is the eastern sky on the right, western sky. The northern sky is down at the bottom. Southern sky is at top, at the top. Good guesses. Nice work out there. I see a lot of you over here that you are correct over here. We see these three dots um, right together over here on the right side of the screen in the eastern sky um, rising. That is Orion's belt and that's what you'll look for um, rising in the east over there. Um, you, you can see um, both of the shoulders of Orion and then the legs that come down in Orion. Um, right here next to Orion. Remember, we've got Orion the Hunter. We've got the Pleiades, the Seven Sisters. And what do we have between? Um, we have uh, Taurus the Bull. So this is Aldebaran. It's Bright Eye, the Bull. And you can see the V here of um, Taurus, which is really cool. I have another one. I have another little... Um, Another quiz for you here. Where are Castor and Pollux of the Gemini constellation? Hello, yes.
Awesome. You guys did a really good job. That is correct over here on the right side. If you remember, um, Rigel is here. We saw Ryan's belt up here. Rigel is up at the top. If we follow Rigel straight through Beetlejuice, we're going to hop right over and it points us right straight to the twins of Gemini, Castor and Pollux right here. Um, this over here, when we are, I was talking about the, sometimes the confusion of um, Castor and Pollux, this is Capella and this is its neighboring star. You can see Auriga kind of moving around here. Um, that is where some people can get confused, but you can see that Capella is much, much brighter than um, its neighboring star. Okay, great job, nice work. You guys are good. Okay, some of the tools and resources, I'll hurry through these because I'm running out of time. But um, like I said, Erin, uh, and I'm within a follow-up email, um, there are um, several links to all of these, but for star charts and star maps, I like to use that star, Sky and Telescope and the Astronomical League. Um, sky Condition, these are the two tools that I talked about. You might just take a picture of this screen. Um, phone and tablet apps, I like to use Stellarium has a web app, but it also has a phone app too, and it's a great app. Um, I also use Skyview every now and again. Um, general websites out there, obviously NASA is a great website about, there. there's a sky watching specific website, and um, um, I, I included that in the, in the linked list. Um, the Lawrence Hall of Science Planetarium has some great information online. And if you want to find more targets um, to look for, uh, either with your binoculars with, or with a telescope, um, with your unaided eye, the Royal Astronomical Society of Canada has some really great um, uh, programs where you can find different targets to look for. If you want to look for astronomy clubs that are in your area, um, a listing of astronomy clubs um, through the Astronomical League or NASA Night Sky Network um, will um, show you clubs that might be in your area. Um, and then here in the middle, I just listed a couple um, uh, sites. I saw someone was from Homer, and Homer, I think, is an um, International Dark Sky Association community. I don't have them listed here, but welcome, Homer community residents. Um, but we do have uh, two official Illinois dark sky parks in Illinois, uh, Middle Fork River uh, Forest Preserve in Champaign County was the first. Um, make sure to, if you are, are really into this, make sure you put that on your list of places to go. Um, and and uh, Powell's Preserves, which is out, outside of the city in Cook County, is also one of the newer um, uh, certified Illinois dark sky parks in Illinois. Uh, there are a couple annual astronomy events, some bigger sky star parties. The Illinois Dark Skies party happen, star party happens annually in the fall at Jim Edgar Panther Creek, which is outside of Springfield in central Illinois. And then the bootleg spring star party um, is in north central Illinois. Next steps. What do you, what should we do next? I will be sending you, and I think Erin has a uh, a um, link for this as well, a stargazer challenge, just a beginner um, stargazer challenge, locating some uh, basic constellations, um, learning celestial coordinates, things like that, celebrating the winter sol solstice. Um, so there's, those are some next steps that you can take on your own and try to be, try to challenge yourself and find these things with, without any aids out in the field. Um, there are, like I mentioned already, observing programs to find targets. So I talked about the Society of Canada, uh, but the Astronomical League um, also has observing programs where you can collect pins. Um, it's all on your own. It's self-reporting. It gives you lots of different targets to look for. Um, there's beginner, mid, advanced different programs that you can use uh, or that you can go through and um, you can collect different pins. And also um, think about becoming a dark sky advocate. The International Dark Sky Association has great resources on their website um, to kind of evaluate your communities, evaluate your own uh, property um, for what types of light pollution that you might be emitting out into the air. What, what types of street lights 
Um, I did this for some students before, and we did kind of an inventory of different lights that are in um, our community. And, and you'll you'll never look at a street light or a parking lot light ever the same after you do that. So just think about um, what could you could do in your community. I'll leave you then before we start. We have a few minutes for questions. Um, this is just a, a fun uh, poem that just talks about the different um, uh, constellations that uh, come up during the winter night sky. And um, I thought it was just fitting for, for our time today. So I thank you guys so much for joining us today. Do we have any questions that I might be able to answer while I have you on here? Yes, we do. Thank you so much, Amy. That was a wonderful presentation and lots of great resources. Like she said, we will send those out. Mm -hmm. um, I didn't put them all in there. I put a lot of them, but um, there's a lot of great information that you can spend a lot of time diving into um, mm -hmm. after the presentation.